Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for those of you who haven't yet set up your audio, please do that now. Uh, you simply go to Tools, select Audio, and then Audio Setup. My name is Carla Wool, and I will be your moderator for the webinar. We very much want this to be a discussion, so after the lecture, we will allow some time for questions. Um, I'd like to take a moment to give you a quick tour of the program we're using. In the middle of the left-hand portion of your screen, you will see a text box. And that's where you can type questions. And you can either type them as they occur to you during the lecture, or wait until the question and answer part of the program. You can also click the emoticons, the smiley face, so you see it right there, going up next to my name, uh, or the confused face. You can give Dick thumbs up or thumbs down. We hope not. Um, and that way, you can give him some feedback during the election. Whoops, let me get rid of that one there. Uh, let me here. Definitely want to get rid of that. Hang on. Okay. Okay. Now, our lecture today is about how to build and create healthy communities. Our speaker is Dr. Dick Jackson, who is chair of our Environmental Health Sciences Department. Dr. Jackson is a pediatrician and has served in many leadership positions with the California Health Department, including the highest state health officer. For nine years, he was director of the CDC's National Center for Environmental Health in Atlanta. His research focuses on how the built environment impacts health, an issue he believes takes on critical importance as we face an avalanche of chronic and preventable diseases and staggering environmental challenges. So Dr. Jackson, the microphone is all yours. Thank you very much, Carla. And uh, Happy New Year to all the participants. And uh, I've been thinking a lot as we go into this millennium just the multitude of challenges that we are facing and just how important it is to perhaps get past 20th century thinking where we solve problems within individual stovepipes, began to think about solutions that cross multiple uh, challenges uh, and multiple areas. My father's cousin lives up on the coast of Maine, and if you visit the house and want to go swimming, you go underneath into what this is an old basement, and on the side of the wall is written um, Halloween Storm 1991. It was the only time in 100 years this place flooded, and that was the perfect storm. It was a collision of three powerful storms, one coming from Greenland, one a hurricane coming from the south, and one coming across the country. And I think our country at this point is facing a perfect storm. The challenges are coming in different directions, and the solutions, because the problems are interlinked at this point, need to cross domains. We can't stay in our individual stovepipes. I think the first storm is the social storm, and health is embedded deeply in that storm. Every student in the School of Public Health has seen the USA obesity maps. But I will tell you at CDC, this was going on a good 10 years before anyone came to the director's office and said, you know, we're looking at a rapid increase in the body uh, volume of Americans. And this was by 96, 97. It had been going on a good 10 years at that point. This is a map of the United States in 1991, and you can see uh, California at about 10 to 14 percent of our population obese based upon telephone calls. And very rapidly over time, we've seen changes. Uh, over 20% of the majority of states by the year 2000, people with a body mass index over 30 defined as obese. And by 2009, two brand new colors, um, over 25 to 29% in Texas and Florida obese, over 30% in some of the Mississippi states uh, down the middle. This epidemic has gotten the attention of everyone from the president and first lady on down to the average family practitioner who sees hour by hour people coming in with unmanageable uh, weight problems. And very often in America, we tend to blame an individual because of his or her lack of self-control. But in truth, we have created an environment that is profoundly obesogenic, profoundly drives obesity, both in terms of the products that we provide to people, the sales, and the removal of physical activity, particularly incidental physical activity from our lives. This epidemic, the average adults gained about 25 pounds in 25 years. Children, for teenagers, obesity and overweight have tripled 
just over the last two, three decades. And for preteens, it has quadrupled over that same period of time. Go back and watch Leave it to Beaver or television shows from the 50s and 60s, and you're struck at how thin people were by comparison to where we are today. At this point, two out of every seven volunteers for the US military cannot get in because of obesity and lack of fitness. So this is more than cosmetic. It is really a threat to the health and well-being of the United States. Obesity raises our risk of high blood pressure, of stroke, a series of diseases, but one we worry about um, very much is diabetes. And tracking right along with the increase in average body weight in the United States, we've seen an increase in the prevalence of diabetes, particularly what we used to call adult onset diabetes, and now we call type 2 diabetes. Um, whoop, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Here's a map in 1994 looking at diabetes prevalence. These are people with diagnosed diabetes. Uh, you can see California at about less than 4.5% in 1994. By 2007, 75 to 9%. Uh, and um, we have states with over 9%. So walk down the street in Georgia at this point, and close to one person in 10 has a disease that will cost them their eyes, retinopathy, their kidneys, nephropathy, and their feet, uh, gangrene, and eventually, of course, their lives. We're now spending 2% of the entire gross domestic product of the United States on diabetes. These are crushing costs. Um, if you become diabetic before age 40, it reduces your um, lifespan by about 14 years and it reduces your quality of life by about 20 years. Um, if you're, you've got gangrene of the feet and you're going to dialysis three times a week, your quality of life is very bad. My point here is the obesity epidemic is going to have huge health risks as well. A person with a body mass, a woman with a body mass index of over 35, that is, she's at the point where she would qualify for bariatric surgery, stomach stapling surgery, that woman's risk of becoming diabetic is a hundred times greater than when she was thin. So um, this is all, uh, this is the result of the obesity epidemic that I've just been talking about. This. Uh, News article, diabetes to afflict one in three. Think of your favorite um, little children and thinking about one in three of them having uh, this disease in their lifetime. Every adult I know has had a friend or knows someone with diabetes or even has lost their life uh, to this disease. And as you know, we're looking at actually declines, projected declines in American lifespan as this epidemic continues. So. This is a matter of life or death to reverse this epidemic. At the same time we've become heavier, we have become more and more unfit. Most of the listeners, if they were children during the 50s and 60s, the majority of you, us, walked to school. By the year 2000, only about one child in six walks to school, and in part it's because we've built large big box schools on cheap land distant from where people live. My children went to school, high school in Atlanta, Georgia. There was not a sidewalk within five miles of either the middle school or the high school. They could not have walked or biked even if they wanted to. Do you think that this decline in walking and biking has had an effect on fitness? Tom Torlickson, uh, who I first met when he was an assembly member, then became a senator in Sacramento, and ultimately is now state schools commissioner, a uh, terrific man, uh, was behind putting the fitness gram in place for students in California. I don't think the body mass index ought to be on the report card, but I do think uh, the measure in six fitness areas should be on the report card. This is pretty frightening. Three quarters of our ninth graders cannot pass a simple fitness gram, and one of the things you're expected to do is run walk a 12-minute mile. Why, we have deans of schools of public health that can run walk a 12-minute mile. So over the course of my uh, medical training, we've gone from about 7% of all the money in the United States going to medical care. We're at um, about 17% of all the money in the United States going to medical care, and it will be about 20% by the year 2020. 
This is not generating wealth necessarily. It is simply sopping up um, the wealth of the country as we care for these chronic diseases. So just as 100 years ago we were confronting epidemics of infectious disease, we are now code blue urgently needing to confront epidemics of chronic diseases, particularly obesity and diabetes. Well, um, with all that money we're spending, and we're spending uh, more of our gross domestic product than any other developed country in the world, the bar at the top is the United States, and you can just go down and see just how much further ahead we are than the rest of the world in our spending on medical care. This is before we've begun to harvest these epidemics of obesity and diabetes to the level that we're going to see over the next 20 years or so. We must be really healthy if we're spending that much money. Well, actually, um, here's our pharmaceutical expenditures, $271 billion. That's just prescribes uh, pharmaceuticals, again, more than anyone else in the world. And here's our life expectancies. We're in dark green, so we look um, about equivalent to um, the best countries in the world. But according to the CIA chart book, our life expectancy is number 49 around the world, despite the money that we spend. This is a strong argument for investments in public health. It is even a stronger argument for investments in prevention. But up until now, we have failed to spend our first dollars on prevention. It's always the last dollars. So I've talked about a social and a health storm very quickly, but um, I want to talk about the economic storm that we are facing. This is a graph of very updated um, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. The blue line is unemployment in the United States. Um, over the last uh, 20 years, you can see that um, we've had spikes up and down, but the spike we're in right now of unemployment is the highest it's been since uh, the Great Depression. And sadly, California is a good 2% percentage points higher than the rest of the country. It's going to be uh, quite a bit of time before we pull out of this recession. And some people may argue that we may never. Um, as bleak as those numbers look, look at the share of the labor force unemployed for more than 26 weeks. It's the highest point since the Great Depression. Those unemployment numbers that look worrisome Actually, two-fifths of those people, 44%, have been unemployed for longer than 27 weeks. In fact, some of them have lost their unemployment benefits. Well, that's part of the economic storm. But I'd like you to look quickly at this paper from uh, uh, Robert Frank and, and uh, colleagues on expenditure cascades and what we've seen over the last 40 years or so in terms of who is making money and who isn't. This is how our incomes, average American incomes, changed between 1949 and 1979. First 30 years of my brother Jim's life, and a rising tide raised all boats. The bottom 20%, top 20%, everybody increased by about 100% of their real income. Well, that's good news. What happened in the 30 years since then? You can see that the bottom portion of the population is not pulling out of, uh, is not rising in terms of their income. The top 20% has gone up about 46%, and the top 5% has gone up 68%. That, of course, is before tax U.S. incomes. What do you think it is after taxes? So the top 20% has gone up 68%, and the top 1% after tax income has gone up 200%. So it's a perfect storm for the bottom 80% in terms of health and social and also in terms of economics. And I am a bit discouraged about these folks pulling out, partly because um, of their already constricted incomes. They're spending close to 40% of it on shelter and transportation. Americans now spend a larger portion of their incomes, of our incomes, on transportation than any people on the face of the earth. Well, that's the average for the US. What happens to poor people? For the poorest people, they spend an even larger portion of their income on transportation. So this issue of transportation is a social equity issue that's
an economic issue, as well as, of course, an environmental and safety issue. Uh, so any way that we can have people get to their jobs um, without costing huge amounts of money and time and stress is a good thing. Um, since I moved to Los Angeles a few years ago, I've learned that many people that I talk to say that the most stressful part of their day is not their job, it's getting to and from work. So one of the reasons we spent a lot of time getting to and from work is we've sp built between a um, 1 million and 3 million homes every year, and many of them look just like this. These are built on what we call green fields. This is verdant pasture land, uh, dairy land, farmland. It's now being paved over with what the farmers call the last and most profitable crop, profitable crop, namely houses. Why do people move, for example, in Berkeley, people would move all the way out to Tracy, junior professors would, because that's where they could afford to live. Berkeley hadn't built enough affordable housing, and it continued to be a one-story um, community to a large extent. In Los Angeles, uh, many of our faculty and students have to commute long distances because they cannot afford to live close to where they go to school. Because of the way we've built the United States, we have removed 60,000 square miles of photosynthesis of trees. Trees provide shade, reduce our risk of melanoma, um, cool the air, reduce the risks of asthma and air pollution, allow water to percolate into the ground. That water is um, clean naturally before it gets to the streams to supply our drinking water. And in the act of paving over the landscape of the US, we greatly increase not just heat, we greatly increase the risk of flash floods. In fact, there are very serious people that say the flooding that's gone on in Brisbane and, and uh, Australia is in many ways being driven by the degree of sprawl that has occurred in that area and also, of course, the warming of the ocean associated with climate change. My friend Larry Cohn says that uh, the built environment is social policy in concrete. Northwest Atlanta did not want um, poor people from downtown Atlanta moving to Gwinnett County where Newt Gingrich and Bob Barr were from. And so they trusted that the highway would get them back and forth to where they needed to be. There are 23 lanes that stop three hours a day and they're still opposed to putting mass transit to get people back and forth to work downtown. And uh, everyone in Los Angeles, I did this screenshot of the SIG alert, but most of us are accustomed to seeing particularly the 405 bright red um, going up and down and many of the other highways in Los Angeles bright red. It truly is astonishing to me to see that we're adding one more lane to the 405 in each direction rather than putting mass transit or light rail up and down the center strip the way they've done on Highway 24 and other highways um, in the Bay Area. Um, it, is proven that you do not reduce congestion over longer than about two to three years by adding more lanes. It simply draws more people to the road. The way you reduce it is to get people out of their cars, either because they don't have to commute such a long distance or um, there is transit to get them back and forth. The third part of the third storm of the um, perfect storm is environmental. And I won't go too long on this, but um, I would assert I would assert that no one should graduate grammar school or high school in the United States without knowing what the Keeling curve is. Professor Keeling of the University of California in San Diego um, has measured CO2 levels at the top of Mount um, uh, at Mauna Loa in Hawaii, and year in and year out, the levels have gone up. So when the, some of the faculty were born, the average CO2 of planet Earth's atmosphere was about 300 parts per million. Um, it is now at 385 parts per million and continuing to go up. In fact, it even looks like um, respirations. It goes, um, CO2 levels go up during the northern hemisphere winter and go down during the northern hemisphere summer, but it to me looks like a patient who is breathing but is also retaining CO2 and we all know what will happen to that patient unless intervention occurs. And the intervention, I'm going to skip this slide, but the intervention that needs to occur is uh, reducing CO2 loading of the atmosphere and um, increasing planting of uh, photosynthetic uh, trees and other um, vegetation. Over the last um, 25 years, 
the ground has gotten hotter. It makes planting and crops more challenging. The oceans become warmer, which makes the oceans expand and rise. And we're seeing substantial melting of the polar ice caps. Your grandchildren, if they become astronauts, will fly around planet Earth and will look down on the North Pole. And there will be no white up there within about 40 to 50 years. In fact, the hottest year on record was 2010. It equaled 2005. So um, this is not going away. And my colleagues in community health sciences talk substantially and should talk about social justice and environmental justice issues. These are the countries that produce greenhouse gas emissions made fat in this cartogram if they produced a lot um, and made small if they produced a little. Where do you think we will see death, morbidity, and mortality um, related to these uh, greenhouse gas changes. The prosperous countries will be able to weather them reasonably well, but poor countries um, will be massively impacted. Bangladesh, with a two, two meter sea level rise, could generate well over a million, uh, I'm sorry, a hundred million refugees. So the solutions to all of this bleak, and I don't mean to be so, um, I am being quite bleak, but I don't think that 20th century thinking and picking on these problems one at a time will any longer work. We are going to have to think about solutions that work. One is that we need to create urban spaces. More than half the planet now is living in urban places, and there are genuine benefits to that. There is more prosperity. Family sizes are very effectively reduced when people move to urban environments. The per person carbon footprint is less, and there's better access to health care and other sorts of activities in a well-governed um, um, urban place. But we're also going to have to retrofit urban spaces that haven't been working so well. This is a busy street in Oakland. Uh, some of you have probably driven down it. Um, Steve White uh, has done drawings describe what it would look like if it were a healthy place. Number one, we need to build two and three or four-story buildings. They use energy far more efficiently. There need to be triple frame windows. There are no solar panels on the roof of these buildings, but they need to be there as well. Um, it does not have enough green cover right now to really reduce temperatures and reduce CO2 and um, ozone conversion, but uh, with tree planting that could occur. There needs to be better access to fruits, vegetables, and healthy food. At this point in America, we don't grow anywhere near enough fruits and vegetables. Um, in fact, if everybody in America ate the diet that the Surgeon General recommends, we'd run out of fruits and vegetables in about three days. We provide crop subsidies and huge um, f financial subsidies for things that are bad for people, or at least not very healthy, lots of fats and lots of sugars. And we provide no subsidies for things that are healthy for people. And oh, by the way, California produces half the fruits and vegetables in the United States. So there's an economic benefit for the United States. People that are riding in uh, trolley cars or light rail are generating about tenfold less uh, pollution than uh, people that are driving in a car. People that are bicycling are producing even less pollution as are uh, people that are walking and they are burning fat, not fossil fuels, in the process of doing that. The tree cover will reduce temperature. There's another uh, item about this picture that I want to point out to you. If you want to reduce crime, one of the most effective things you can do is put eyes on the street. And you can see with both the storefronts and the second and third floor windows, um, crime goes down, this kind of uh, building is done. Um, in Tampa, Florida, they showed a 50% reduction in crime by simply creating um, venues that put eyes on the street. So this is solving injury problems, it's solving uh, energy problems, it's solving physical activity and social uh, challenges at the same time. People say, well, I don't want to live in density, and yet um, these same folks would be thrilled for a trip to uh, Paris or um, for that matter, even New York, um, where we revel in density. What people don't want is bad density. We don't want dirty or noisy density. One has to really invest in creating quality density that meets people at different economic strata, different social strata, and different racial uh, strata as well. As we speak, this report is being released by the Center for Clean Air Policy. There's been a belief in the United States that as vehicle miles driven goes up, that we become more prosperous. And this fascinating report from the Center for Clean Air Policy, which you can Google and go online for, 
is it's about a 50-page report. I lifted this one slide from it. They're showing that GDP wealth is now separating from vehicle miles traveled. So I, I would assert the vehicle miles traveled, the more it goes up, the more we undermine um, our fitness, undermine our health, um, create um, more social isolation rather than um, and actually burn off money in ways that are not very productive. So anything we can do to get people out of their cars is a uh, good thing. The more time you spend in the car, this is my colleague and co-author Larry Frank study in Atlanta, the more time you spend in the car, the more likely you are to be obese. Black, white, male, female, young, old. The more you walk, the less likely you are to be obese. Your grandmother told you that. And the better the design, this is really the critical issue, if you have destinations to walk to, if it's fun to walk, you are far more likely to do it than if it's scary or it's all blank walls or it's a place that you really, there are no destinations that make the trip worthwhile. Walking is the best treatment we have for both obesity reduction or exercise, but obese, uh, walking is the best, and for diabetes, or at least pre-diabetes prevention. This is a classic NIH study of 3,000 people, um, joined a walking club, walked five days a week for 30 minutes. At the end of six months, they had lost about 6% of their body weight. They reduced their risk of becoming diabetic by 58%. There is no drug, no treatment that works as well at preventing onset of diabetes in pre-diabetics than walking. Obviously, you have to control your diet, but this is very effective. Kids need to walk to school. It is a disgrace that we have taken children's legs away from them. Walking and biking to school, not only do they become healthier, do they become fit, do they produce less carbon uh, greenhouse gases, they actually learn better, their mood gets better, they remember better, and they are more creative. So the Safe Routes to Schools program is an important public health intervention. And fortunately, uh, Secretary LaHood of Transportation um, is committed to this. And at least up until this new Congress, there's been a genuine commitment to Safe Routes to Schools programs. Um, when you put the infrastructure in place, and if you put it in place for um, children, other people use it as well people begin to use it. Look at the success that Portland has had um, for people um, walking or biking to work every day. It's routine for people to show up at a meeting in bicycle clothes and putting their helmet on the side. It is normative at this side, at this point. Wouldn't it be great if that were true in this wonderful city of Los Angeles with its marvelous climate and its relatively flat um, landscape? This should be the bicycling capital of the United States not Portland. In fact, just to stay with that, um, we've all been pushing for safe routes to schools, thinking of grammar schools and high schools. I think we be, need to begin to advocate for safe routes to universities, because I know my students want to bicycle too, but they don't feel safe in doing it. Every building ought to have pleasant and attractive stairways. One flight of stairs a day, if you walk up, is burning off about a pound of body weight at the end of a year. Uh, we have buildings now where you search desperately to find a stairway, and it's impossible to do it. The architects would love to build buildings with attractive vertical features. Every new building needs to have pleasant, attractive stairways and not lock people in boxes that go up and down if they want to go up and down uh, to other floors. The Academy of Pediatrics has issued a statement saying that children need to grow up in walkable, well-designed communities. These um, communities I showed a picture of with the loop and lollipop structure with lots of dead ends and cul-de-sacs, they're probably OK for three, four, and five-year-olds. They are a recipe for boredom and loneliness for 13, 14, and 15-year-olds. Kids are completely dependent on parents. I recommend this Academy of Pediatrics statement from the Committee on Environmental Health, also the Committee on um, Community Health and Nutrition. Everyone needs access to a park. Um, nearby parks increase the value of homes by about $100,000 if you're right across the street from it. I'm talking about condo apartments in many different areas. And it drops by about $25,000 a block till you get further out. People exercise more with nearby parks. And the air temperature drops and environmental quality um, and air pollution drops in the presence of green space around parks. Parks ought to be a civil right. And particularly for poor people in Los Angeles, it's very difficult to get to parks. 
there have been wonderful leaders in Los Angeles, and I think the efforts to both capture winter water and to do extensive more tree planting, including vegetative or uh, fruit tree planting um, in Los Angeles, particularly led by tree people, have been very admirable. If you get a chance to visit tree people up in Mulholland, I, I strongly recommend it. Um, the effort, Los Angeles was the leading agricultural county in the United States in 1945, produced more um, table food than any other place and more economic value. And we've turned around and paved over this wonderful basin. Um, we have parking lots that are scarcely used that could be turned into places that produce food. Um, and we wouldn't have to be eating food that is being transported four to 7,000 miles. This is a terrific program called Sustainable Agricultural Education, SAGE. Um, they are converting. Um, quite unused parkland in Northern California, Sun Oil Regional Park, and um, minorities, particularly Southeast Asian refugee uh, folks, are working growing very high value crops, generating income, creating, uh, removing CO2, and um, creating oxygen, and uh, creating community in the same process. Every school needs to have a garden. Kids need to know where food comes from, and the teachers need to know where it comes from as well. Um, no child complains about eating Swiss chard or some other locally grown vegetable, if they or carrots for that matter, if they participated in growing it. The city of Lincoln, California, the um, schools are supplied entirely by the gardens that are being uh, grown by the middle and high school kids. Every community in California needs a farmer's market. Yes, I know it's for um, wealthy people and upper end folks um, sometimes because it's more expensive. But by late afternoon, all that food is quite affordable for anyone. And up until very recently, if you lived in a place like Richmond, California, it was impossible to buy fruit or fresh green beans or, for that matter, fresh flowers or anything else in your neighborhood. And we need to do big infrastructure. This is about reducing um, greenhouse gases, helping people meet uh, their economic needs, creating huge amounts of jobs, and uh, really creating community as well. This is the high-speed rail in Japan. They put this in place for the Olympics in the 1960s. They have now moved 5 billion passengers over the last 40 years without a single fatality. Um, it is a delight and a pleasure to go from these cities one to another. And yet none of us, all of us, dread the drive from Los Angeles to San Francisco. And you, we know how expensive it is if you want to fly. And your carbon footprint, if you're flying, is 40 times higher than if you drive. And if you drive, of course, is much higher than if you bicycle. But we're not likely to do that. China's um, eating our lunch when it comes to high-speed rail. They're putting it all through China. The Europeans are doing the same thing. They don't believe that airplanes should be used for short distance flights. And um, the, their investment has generated enormous numbers of jobs. And they calculate a, about a five-fold ratio on every dollar spent on this infrastructure for what they get back fed into their economy. Sadly, California, I don't think this will happen in my lifetime. I certainly hope it happens in uh, my children's lifetime that we get high-speed rail. And at a very practical level, we need to do everything we can to welcome and encourage people to walk, to bike, to meet their life needs. Um, uh, Congressman Mark Leno is behind uh, a bill that requires complete streets. And at this point, all new streets being built or retrofitted in California are to be complete streets. By complete streets, I mean they need to be usable by everyone, not just cars. By young, old, disabled bicyclists, um, moms pushing baby strollers, and the rest. So I think there are real changes that are occurring in California that are um, very encouraging, but we need to stay on track. Um, this is the book I've been working on. This will be the textbook um, that I'm doing with Howie Frumkin, the dean at the School of Public Health in um, University of Washington, and with Andrew Dannenberg, who's the first editor and author. And many of our colleagues are contributing sections to this. Um, I personally am working on a PBS special um, on the, with the Media Policy Center in Santa Monica on built environment and health. It is, PBS has agreed to two hours, and this will air shortly. And this is the companion book uh, for that uh, book. So 
Whip this. Let me stop. Thank you so thank much, you Dick. Very we much. do have about 25 minutes for questions. So if those of you who have questions, if you just want to type your question in the text box on the left-hand side of your screen. And Dick, there's one there from Mark Carmel. He's asking if there's anyone at UCLA for the public health involved with the South Bay Vitality City Blue Zone Project. And I'm embarrassed, Mark. I don't know. Um, I I've only been here two years. I know Northern California better. Um, I do have an appointment over at the School of Urban Planning, and we've been working on a joint degree, um, a three-year degree between urban planning and public health, but it's only now with environmental health sciences in the school. It will happen both ways. I think the other thing we're going to need to do is begin to pull together a listserv and a working group. Um, a lot of the students are very interested in this, and it would be a better way to keep ourselves alerted to many of the issues. Um, I don't know if Mark you can speak or if anyone else uh, knows more about that and I apologize that I don't. We'll wait for some more questions to come but may maybe Dick I can pose one now and that is what do you say to people who say well we can't just raise the cities we have to build these um, healthy new communities. What do you do? What do you tell them and what do you do in the meantime? Well you know we essentially built marvelous communities before World War II and then we became uh, quite car dependent and this was not an accident. The oil industry and General Motors bought up the light rail and trolley cars in many of the major cities including Los Angeles. I remember being a child and watching on television as uh, cable cars and trolley cars were being towed out into the Pacific Ocean and dropped in the ocean because we're all going to be liberated by uh, the arrival of the automobile. Um, it took two to three generations to go from not very many people driving and most people traveling um, using light rail and transit to the point that um, everyone is in a car and we're barely moving over 10 miles an hour because of the gridlock that we've created. We've got to start somewhere. Um, I, my first step that I would argue is we've got to focus on children. Um, because the environments we're creating now do not work well for children. Every child ought to have ought to be able to walk or bike safely to school. Oh, by the way, I feel strongly that we need to have a tax on uh, sugar. Um, people don't need as much as we have. It's not doing us any good, and the, those funds could be used to support intervention programs in schools, exercise programs as, as well. I think we need to create the political will um, in our leaders, and it's one the reasons I've been interested in doing this PBS series, but it's also, we're beginning to see it more and more. I've addressed, um, and I and many others have addressed the Mayor's Institute. The mayors um, are quite interested in how do we design so um, this will, uh, we can create places that work. A, a southern city, not a hotbed of liberalism, uh, namely uh, Nashville, now has a complete streets requirement and its elected officials completely embracing the fact that a city of the 21st century needs to have an exciting downtown. The millennials, the generation Ys, don't want to move to places that are boring, isolated, require they sit in cars all the time, and they want to be in walkable communities. So this is happening. The marketplace and the community desire is actually ahead of the developers and the funding people in the We banks. have a question from Trish Rado. She wants to know how we get architects trained in the built environment. Um, Trish, uh, the uh, there is increasing awareness. The um, architects are actually uh, involved in two big efforts, AIA now. Uh, one is related to hospital design and healthcare facility design with 30 million people um, coming on, coming into health insurance with healthcare reform, which I hope is not uh, in any way nullified. Um, we're going to need more healthcare facilities. They've got to be designed to move people through more readily. They've got to be more accessible. Um, I, it is ridiculous to be building hospitals um, that are not on transit systems, for example, not just for the patients and their families, but also for the employees. Um, so we're going to have to rethink hospitals. They have to be much more sustainable. A lot of the newer hospitals are more sustainable. And the other part of it is we need to make and help architects be aware that um, architects are to have, to have three commitments um, to the utility of the buildings, to the strength of the building, that is, they don't fall down, that is, namely the safety into the beauty of buildings, but for a long time the, the safety issue was um, just a nod to it, and many of them don't realize that 
um, architects and design professionals are health professionals, and, and they've begun to step up. Trish, I see your question about um, the PBS special. Uh, we're delivering the final um, cut to PBS, I think, next week. So um, it's up to them whether it will air either before the summer or after. My preference is that it would not air during the summer. There's another question from Sarah Dick. How much would it cost to transform an unhealthy street to a healthy street with trees, solar paneling, et cetera? You know, sir, I should know that answer. Um, a lot of it. You know, a lot of this has to be done when there's money going in for the infrastructure already, whether they're ripping it up to change sewers or the rest. Um, there's a terrific program that Gene Armbruster and Gail Haberman are working on in Los Angeles. It's called the PLACE program. And um, they, the first step in that is actually to get community buy-in. Um, there is kind of a push that people have a right to drive anywhere, anytime, um, as much as they want. It, it works until everybody decides they want to do that, and then we have gridlock. Um, in fact, I was talking to someone that bicycled the whole length of, I think it was Wilshire during the Cyclovia. There was an event where six miles of the main street downtown was closed, and a lot of people discovered that you could get to work more quickly on the bike than they could um, uh, in their car or in the traffic overall. But it's going to take, there is funding in the ERA funding, there is some effort around pushing this in the prevention funding. I think um, we've got to create an infrastructure of people that are interested and want to work uh, on this and create the social will to make it happen. We certainly have the social will and the, and the political will and the oil industry and the car industry wanted the opposite to happen. So we're going to have to counter this at this other level. I just a quick sidebar. When Howie Frumkin and Larry Frank and I wrote the first book that was published in 2004, we were able to read the essentially the entire available literature on built environment and health. At this point, we cannot possibly keep up. Uh, there's so many things coming out of the Before 2004, there were no sessions on built environment and health at APHA. At the last APHA, there were 140 sessions. Um, so there's a real outpouring of interest in this, and we've got to create the social will before we can get the political will. Mark, thank you for posting that, the link to the South Bay project. Um, Julie, uh, Dick wants to know, um, in the university setting, um, where you start, who should be involved, and what are some suggested first steps? Julie, you know, we've got a bunch of allies in the, in the university setting. We've got a sustainability coordinator. We have a chancellor who is committed to sustainability. And yes, sustainability is recycling and um, not printing and doing all those things. But the next step in sustainability is how do we get people um, here without burdening their car, uh, without the carbon footprint. Um, we've been, we, the public health people along with um, the LA County Health Department have been very involved in doing a health impact assessment of the uh, subway, the so-called subway to the sea, and really looking at um, these transportation plans, what would be the implications for health, for um, obviously carbon footprint issues and, and air pollution, but also injury prevention for um, safe walking and the rest. I think there's going to be a huge opportunity with health impact assessment. Here at UCLA, um, Brian Cole has been a major leader, and there's a good website, maybe someone could post it, on the HIA health impact assessment activities that are going on. It, you know, it's ridiculous. In the United States, if the government wants to do a major project, a very expensive, extensive environmental impact assessment is done, looking at flora, fauna, Indian ruins, and a whole series of other things. But up until now, there's been no substantive look at what happens to young people, old people, and everyone in between. And we need to be able to, and we have to assess what's the impact on people's health. I was invited to do a talk a while back in Salinas, and they took me to a school that was being built, and they were taking over like 20 to 30 acres of the deepest, darkest, most beautiful soil you'd ever seen to build a school at the edge of two high-speed arterial roads, no sidewalks, big turnaround, and big parking lots because every child was expected, even if they only lived 200 yards away, to come to school via motorized vehicle. So 
turning around this, and if there had been a proper health impact assessment of that school, they wouldn't have done it this way. Uh, thank you, Tamana, for posting the link to the HIA guide that Dick was just talking about. Um, Dick Ming is asking uh, what can be done to push the California Public Transportation Improvement Project forward in terms of pushing the political agenda and improving public transportation, asking about whether the anti-tobacco campaign uh, model would work. Um, the, the anti-tobacco model, I think, is a really powerful one. And I would argue that the three big elements there, one was the tax, because the tax gener generated and paid for a lot of the anti-tobacco advertising. And it also discouraged young smokers, young people from starting smoking. And then the environmental element of banning indoor tobacco smoking was extremely important as well. I would think that um, if we could get, and I absolutely believe we need a penny a teaspoon tax on sugared beverages, it's not going to put, it's not going to make anyone go broke, and um, we need to use that money to promote health. I think that would be a very important first step. I will say that there's been a huge change in the Department of Transportation from what it was a few years ago. Uh, Secretary LaHood is actually talking about 25% of highway funding going to active transportation and transit. This is hugely greater than what it was even three or four years ago. I will tell you the pushback from the oil industry, the car industry, and the road industry, particularly the gravel and, and trucking and contracting and steel industry, has been enormous. So um, we're in for a political fight with the next big transportation bill. And the transportation bill is hundreds of billions of dollars. One of the big stumbling blocks we have is a ridiculous law that says all the gasoline taxes um, need to be used only for highways. And I would argue that it needs to be used for tra for people getting to where they need to go. And if it's highways, that's fine. But if it's um, good quality transit, by the way, every time we take transit, we make travel easier for the people in their car. So everybody wins with high quality transit. And walking and biking is the triple win because you get health. I have to tell a quick story of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, three or four years ago, put in a light rail system. And uh, there was a before and after study that was done. Um, colleagues, uh, folks at RAND uh, did this study. What they found was after about a year and a half, the folks that were using transit were far more likely to meet the Surgeon General's guidelines for um, physical activity. They had lost, on average, about six pounds of body weight. And all of America would get a lot healthier if everybody lost six pounds of body weight. And um, they had reduced their carbon footprint at the same time. Transit does work, and it's a triple win. Belinda is asking why Portland is so successful and how we can translate those elements uh, to a city like Los Angeles. Um, I, I think, you know, it's interesting when you think about climate. Um, I would much rather bicycle in, La in Los Angeles than I would in Portland. Um, and it's a pretty hilly city, too. Uh, you know, I think it's got to start with this whole discussion we're having about raising people's consciousness. One deficit that I would argue that both my environmental friends and certain of my bicycle friends have been guilty of up until now is they have not linked adequately with the health community. And I will tell you, when there is a hearing about some transit decision, if the mayor's um, diabetologist or the nurse that's taking care of the children of the county supervisor comes in and says, I'm desperately worried about the obesity epidemic. I'm worried about the asthma epidemic that keeps going up and up and we know is associated with air pollution. And we health people want to have people get about their lives, both the the need to get back and forth to work and, and to get the food and other things we need to live without always having to be in a car um, so that the health people really need to be speaking up. The California Medical Association has been very good. They've had a series of resolutions about this. But uh, I think a much stronger white coat, if you will, green coat, um, work coat, um, blue collar linkage that will fix health, economy, and the environment at the same time. We've got to stop with stovepipe solutions and really think about a whole reimagination of our environment in the United States. Uh, Mark, Mark is asking if there are any uh, new towns similar to Celebration Florida that are built to be healthy cities. Um, 
You know, the problem with Celebration, and this is a city that was built to affiliate with Disney, is it's still extremely car dependent. In fact, my, I was told that the... Now I'm mixing it up with another site, so I may be mixing up two sites. One was very much focused on the elderly, and it is very important that as we think about rebuilding cities or even developing future cities, that you have genuine economic diversity. Everybody knows rich people need poor people, but poor people need rich people around because um, if you have diversity of incomes, um, in a poor neighborhood, if there are wealthier people there, the services get better. But you also need diversity of age, you need um, social diversity at the same time, and then you begin to have a viable community. And many of these communities are so stratified uh, in terms of which income group and which age group they're dealing with, they're not terribly interesting places to live. Some of the retrofits of cities, what we're finding is people want to retire and live out the rest of their lives where they raised their kids, where they lived. But in many parts of suburbia, once you give up that big house with the front lawn, there's no place that's near your friends and near your neighbors that you can move to. And so we've got to have communities that, have, that welcome people at every different life stage. You do need a bigger house when you're raising your family, but you don't want to be taking care of it once you're, you're an empty nester. And so creating diverse communities with all economic strata uh, social strata is really going to be very important. Uh, here we go. The, uh, the healthiest city uh, town in the United States, and I guess conversely, the least healthy. Um, well, the one is people are surprised, but New York City has done very well, and they actually have a wonderful, maybe someone could put up the link, um, Mayor Bloomberg, and, and by the way, political leadership is extraordinarily important. And every time someone's running for office, we should ask them what they think about healthy cities. Mayor Bloomberg has done a terrific job. They've added about 300 miles of bike lanes to that city in, into Manhattan, just in the I, maybe it's the whole city in the last two to three years. Um, so I would say that's the biggest city. They've done a good job. Um, Chicago is stepping up very substantially. Portland, I would say, for a medium-sized city, is probably um, the healthiest. For a small city, I would assert that Boulder, Colorado, is, is very good. And I would say the walkable um, city of our town of Davis, California, uh, admittedly a university town, but very bikeable, is one of the healthiest um, at that uh, size. But there's no reason. There's no reason that every city couldn't be. Um, my friend Joe Riley, who's the mayor of Charleston, says, we need to build places that people would want to visit. And what we did in the United States for 50 years, we, build pla we built places that nobody would bother taking a picture of. And we need to start building places that really are in and of themselves destinations. Wouldn't you love to live in a place that people would want to come and see? There's no reason we can't do that. Uh, we have a question here um, talking about Washington State just revoking its soft drink and candy tax, a consequence of the current anti-government sentiment. I'm um, asking how we promote health without setting up a health versus increased taxes dichotomy. You know, um, I don't know about the Washington State tax, and I apologize. Um, you know, we had many setbacks in the tobacco battles. We lost many more of them than we won. But ultimately, it's now become common sense that you don't smoke on airplanes in schools or, for that matter, in restaurants or bars. So um, it is extraordinarily important that we not give up on this. Fructose, fructose is only metabolized by the liver. People with large amounts of fructose on board, and that includes kids who are drinking big gulp drinks, 32 ounces, they're getting enormous amounts. Mother Nature did not intend that we consume large amounts of fructose. Glucose works fine for us. Every cell in our body, our muscles, our brain can use glucose. They cannot use fructose. Nature put it in fruits and, and foods in order to induce animals to eat them, consume them, and spread the seeds around the, um, the landscape. To consume products that are 50% glucose, such as large amounts of um, cane sugar, or 55% um, 
fructose, such as high fructose corn sugar, um, is a recipe for disaster. We're now seeing kids. When, when I was a young pediatrician, only we, I never saw a child with type 2 diabetes, we called it adult onset diabetes. My endocrinology colleagues here at UCLA tell me that in the pediatric, diabetes, uh, pediatric endocrine clinic, half the children they're seeing now with diabetes are type 2 diabetics. They've essentially added 20 to 30 years of age to their bodies by having this disease so early um, in their lives. But the other point about fructose and the amount that we're putting in our diet is we are seeing kids with what we call um, pre-cirrhosis, uh, basically inflammatory, inflammatory livers, inflamed livers, because fructose has the same effect as ethanol. And when people begin to understand just how toxic this stuff is, maybe we would have the same response as we had when tobacco. Um, no one's going to be hurt by a penny a teaspoon tax on, on sugar. And a whole lot of good could come from it. And right now, that um, the tax of the, f the tax on our health from all the fructose that we are consuming is enormous and it visits the poor and minorities most heavily. Uh, Ryan is saying we've heard a lot about physical health. What about mental health? Are you aware of any resources in this area? Yeah, I did a paper on um, uh, mental health, it was more, because I'm a pediatrician, it was more focused on children's mental health and it was a, a policy piece for the um, Journal of Child Psychiatry. You know, what are the, the most common disorder in America is depression. And what are the treatments for depression? Um, one is being around, it's social support, psychotherapy, yes, and people talking to each other, but being around the people we love is one way that we deal with depression, particularly when we're going through hard phases in our life, like a death in the family. Uh, and yet we create environments that separate and isolate people. Um, number two, it's physical activity, and exercise works as well as Zoloft for combating depression. And there's quite good evidence at this point that exercise in green spaces and natural spaces actually improves um, your mental status and, for that matter, your creativity and other aspects as well. Um, I don't think there's a psychiatrist in the world that wouldn't rather prescribe exercise than um, antidepressants, um, we resort to it because we've created an environment that is in many ways deeply depressing. You drive up and down many of the arterial roadways in the United States and it's one parking lot filled with uh, lube joints and, and uh, used cars after another. One couldn't think of a better recipe for depression. Um, I, we, are, we are just about out of time. Um, and, but I want you to know, as you just see, Eric's posted it. This webinar will be posted in the next uh, several days. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, we will let everyone know when the documentary airs as soon as we get word. Um, our next webinar is February 16th, when we will continue the conversation with Dr. Hillary Godwin. Uh, she will take you inside the school's new global bio lab, which is opening this year, and also talk about opportunities for collaboration with infectious disease and public health communities. I also want to remind everyone that we're celebrating the School of Public Health's 50th anniversary with a gala February 2nd. It really is going to be a spectacular event where we honor the school's first ever public health champion and hear from MacArthur genius Dr. Atul Gawande. Uh, to purchase tickets, please go to our website, www.ph.ucla.edu, and we hope to see you there. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us.